Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Join me as I seek out the small incremental changes being applied in other industries that we can learn from and that can be applied in healthcare. Can these changes bring immediate value, but also add up to the big improvements and revolution we need in healthcare? Come along with me to explore the possibilities. My innovative guests from around the globe have used small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. And today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Jay Anders. He is the Chief Medical Officer for Medicom. Jay, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Nick. It's a pleasure. As I do with all my guests, I think it's important to set context. And to do that, tell us a little bit about your career and how you arrived at this point uh, in time. That's a, it's kind of an interesting story. At least I think it's interesting. Um, I dabbled with lots of things in my in my medical career, from being um, head of a large multi-specialty group to being medical director of a health plan, uh, as well as being chief medical officer of several iterations of healthcare IT companies. But it all started back when I was actually just out of residency. A colleague of mine who was an emergency room physician back in the time of Next Computers, if anybody remembers that box, uh, we decided that we, since the ER was kind of fraught with problems, we're going to make a new ER electronic medical system. So we started down that road, invested several thousands of dollars, and absolutely went nowhere. But the idea stuck. So as I went through my career, I finally, after 17 years of full-time practice, decided I wanted to get into healthcare IT. And I was asked a question when I first started. It was kind of an interesting question. So why do you, why do you want to get out of practice? It's, why did you do this? I said, well, you think about it this way. You know, in my practice, I saw about five to 6,000 patients a year, patient visits plus hospital. And I made, hopefully made a difference. In healthcare IT, I saw the opportunity to make a difference in hundreds of thousands of visits, simply because we just haven't gotten it right yet. And we're, we're striving, there's been progress. But that's kind of how I started in my healthcare IT career after being a general internist in the trenches for 17 years. So I, interesting, you bring up a lot of, uh, you know, personal memories from my perspective, I had a, a similar sort of sense, you know, my ability to lay hands on individual patients was vastly expanded as I got into the technology side. But I would say my trajectory and, you know, I'll say culpability at this point, uh, relative to the EMR, where you had an experience and it, it, uh, let, let's be clear, it, it failed, uh, it, it didn't work. Um, I had an experience with the EMR where, you know, I saw or perceived this to be this wonderful uh, tool set that we could deliver value, we'd bring information, you know, the single access paper note was clearly insufficient for the purposes of shared care, you know, multi-specialty, all of those things. And we rolled out uh, I, I was part of a number of rollouts of electronic medical records. I, I, I could have been seen at the front cheering everybody on. And in hindsight, I feel like I foisted something on my physician colleagues that was just not sufficiently up to the task. And I've been apologizing and trying to fix it ever since. Tell us a little bit about your experiences as you got into the technology piece. Well, it was very interesting. And it, it, kind of started out the same way yours did in the fact that one of the early EMRs uh, was in a company named Immigrate, which is out of business. Well, got sold and sold and sold. First started out by having a unified view of a medical record. That's all it was to do, was to bring disparate pieces of medical information together, which we're still trying to do. <laughs> but it, that's how it started. And it, it, it grew and it got better. And one of the things that was very obvious from the very beginning is that when we started to involve, one of the reasons I got involved with that company is they wanted a physician representative to the physician provider community. So they wanted someone to go out there and talk to docs. So I took that role on. But what was interesting is after we start, really started talking to the people that were going to use these systems things started to shift. And what I mean by that is the functionality had to keep up with the physician's workflow and thought process and not start to, to 
sucked them down in a rabbit hole, which is what usually these systems did for a while. And they still do to a certain degree, but it's getting better. So talking to them and starting to involve them, and I had our own position advisory board, and I've had that with every company I've worked for now because I set it up. Um, it was remarkable to see the input they have when they're asked, because who knows better what they're doing in, with a patient than the, the per- person providing the care. It's amazing. So with that, it you know, working on, well, what's the next iteration of workflow enhancements and presentation enhancements and those kinds of things to really make that process better and to actually advance the care of a patient. Because when EMR started out, everybody knows this, they were billing mechanisms. That's what they did. That's all they did well, and sometimes not so well, but that's what they were created for. They were never created for patient care. And When you start to introduce that patient care aspect into this workflow and into these systems, and you start to give physicians something back that actually helps them do their job, or the nurses give it, pick a pick a provider, you really start to see amazing change. And what I mean by that is people start to enjoy using things as opposed to, oh, I've got to document another note. And I, I've said that to many colleagues. I said, I didn't go to medical school to write a note. Never did. I went to see and treat patients. That's what I was trained to do. So help me do that. And I think um, as we keep continuing down that road of enhancing that capability, giving the information to folks when they need it, getting it gathered together from all the disparate places it resides, uh, we're going to see a, a little bit of a renaissance. So I, I, I think as, as I sort of unpack this electronic medical record and, you know, the current pressures on our clinical staff, the thing that pervades throughout that I hear and, you know, often is attributed to the electronic medical record, and I think it certainly does contribute, is, well, this is burnout. You know, we put our residents, they end up in the the basement of the hospital, they spend 70% of their time looking at a screen, not at the patient, you know, to your point, that's not what they went to medical school. And, you know, there's a almost a uh, pointing the finger at the electronic medical record. But then I cast my mind back, and I practiced pre electronic medical record era. And it was paper notes, And I know I was burnt out, so it's not new. It's not just the electronic medical record, but it certainly contributes. So if we're to change the way that we practice medicine, is technology, can it be part of the solution? Because it feels like it wasn't as we introduced this. I mean, I think you're right. Bringing the information together was essential because if I was picked one thing, it was finding information in the the days of the paper notes, because as you were talking about it, I'm I'm just cast my mind back to the number of times we do a ward round and say, where are the lab results? No, nope, can't find them. Not to save our lives. Now I think that's probably not true. Better search functions, but we've maybe overlaid more. Is it because of the additional administrative overload? Where where do you see us addressing this so that we can start to deliver? what exactly you and I went to medical school for, which was to treat the patient, not the the system. That's very interesting. And I think technology does have a part in this. One of the things that I have seen that's happened over the years is all of the oversight that is put on the practice of medicine. And when I mean practice of medicine, I mean in every aspect of it. So We've got quality measures, we've got star measures, we've got a health plan that's got certain guidelines they want you to follow. Uh, There's all of that buzzing around you, and there's really nothing right now that, that, well, there's some, but not enough, of things to help you fix that or do something about that. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to just practice medicine? Because most of us know what to do 98% of the time. We do. It's the 2% of the time may have to look something up or guideline or whatever to get all the details. But wouldn't it be nice to practice medicine and let all that stuff just kind of get done in the background? And then maybe uh, something comes up and says, well, you missed this one thing. You've done these 42 things in the normal work of what you've done. But here's the two things you didn't address. And they're part of some guideline somewhere, wherever. 
that you have to. And when the patient's in front of you, have that happen. Uh, that's not the way it is today. And I think that's part of adding burnout to the practice and the delivery of care because clinicians have to bear in mind that if they don't do it correctly, someone's going to call. Someone's going to say, hey, you missed X because of some quality measure or some note requirement or something along those lines, as opposed to why can't we just practice medicine? and let that automatically happen. Technology can do that. I know it can. I've seen examples of it, and I work for a company that provides part of that. So I, I'm very encouraged that that could actually re- alleviate some of that burnout, because you're right. It's not the electronic health record that's burning people out totally. It's all the pursuant, everything else that has to be addressed around a practice of medicine in today's world. So for those of you just joining, I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Jay Anders. He's the chief medical officer for Medicomp. We were just talking about burnout and the contribution of the electronic medical record technology is, you know, at least potentially part of the solution, but it's certainly been part of the problem for for sure. You know, I always cast out. So I think about other industries, other places, and, you know, Contextually to right now, we've just seen a big, um, you know, to use the poker analogy, it's not all in, but it was definitely a big bet and a big raise with Amazon now moving into the space. And, And they've clearly been in. We've seen a number of others. They're a technology company that, to me, gets... Uh, um, an easy experience. I mean, there's a reason that people shop on Amazon. It's it's just, I, you know, I can do it everywhere. I can, uh, you know, it it works one place and the other. Things show up. Uh, it, it, it's just, and it's gotten better over time. Is that what's been missing? Have we missed that customer, and in this case, I guess, patient-centric? Is Do you think that that's going to really start to bring about a change that, individual patients and importantly clinicians will go wow i'm now starting to feel the positive impact of this um i believe it is um amazon definitely has the horsepower as does google and microsoft and now oracle buying cerner there's a lot of this going on right now everybody's got their own little way of doing it when you talk about patient focused versus practice focused that's a really good distinction because i believe as we really start to focus on patient care, treating the patient, making them better, making them not get sick through preventative health care. Um, we actually will save money. Our patients will be happier and will be happier because we're not dealing with the disasters. And that's, you know, as a general internist, every week or so, I would have an absolute catastrophe walk in the door and have to deal with it. Um, but that's not the normal way of doing things. So when you think about Amazon, or think about banking for that matter, when you think about Amazon, you get this beautiful experience, user experience, before you do what you're going to do, which is order a product. So if that's the approach we take in healthcare IT, we're looking for a great user experience. And quite frankly, there's several users, patients are one, providers are another. If we provide that, I can't help but believe that the whole practice of medicine will not be as onerous as it is now portrayed to be. Um, But it's going to take a a multi-system approach to get that done. So it'd be interesting to see what Amazon actually does. Uh, We talked a little bit before about drug pricing and drugs and providing those. And if you know, Everybody has their different way of doing things, and it's almost like airline tickets. You don't know how much you're going to pay and who's going to cover it and who's going to do whatever. Um, If that were more transparent, and I think the non-transparency is also a burnout element when you just don't know what the outcome is going to be when you write a prescription, which is, are they going to be able to pay for it? Are they going to eat whatever you know, you want them to take the drug. So if they got to get it and they got to pay for it, and if the insurance company's involved and all that nonsense, I think that's part of the lack of transparency really leads to burnout. Let's pick up for a second because you, you cited some of the other players that, you know, potentially have the scope to step into this and, and deliver 
a better experience all round. So Google and Cerner and Oracle and so forth. But I, I'm going to push back a little bit and say I, I feel like I saw Microsoft and Google step into this a few years ago. We're going to fix healthcare and I, I, I'm just going to, you know, not to be mean, but they did step back out. I felt with their tail <laughs> between their legs. So is Amazon different, do you think? is I, I mean, I want to be hopeful, to be clear, because I think, you know, this isn't entirely altruistic. I, I need it to work for me. Um, and I want it to work for my colleagues. I want it to work for my daughter, who's just entering the profession. Um, but I, I've, the you know, I've just got this little bird on my shoulder going, hmm, I, I think I've seen this before. Uh, you have, and we all have. <laughs> um, I'm hopeful. Um, I believe that a healthy competition in this regard will further things along better and more quickly. So I'm, I'm hoping that Amazon will take some of their supply chain knowledge and experience and apply it. Uh, are we assured of that? Absolutely not. That, and that's the fear I have. Money does not solve this issue. Being ingenious and and thinking outside the box and transparent will. And we'll just wait and see. So if you were to pick threads of, you know, elements of areas where we have seen value, we've seen improvements in, in your past, and, and I'm sure you've seen instances where we have turned the corner or moved the needle. What, what stands out to you as things that really make a difference in the healthcare space to improve things? That's a very interesting question. Um, I'm going to put on one of my old hats for just a moment as a health plan medical director. Um, back in the old days, and I can say that now, we had a lot of things that we had to see or pre-authorize before we did. Um, and it, it just wasted time and extreme amount of resources and utterly ticked off patients and physicians. I mean, it just didn't work at all anywhere. And it was done, as we've talked about before, uh, to save the insurance company money or to make sure that we're delivering the care at the appropriate levels. That's the party line. That is starting to go away. Um, certain things are no longer have to be pre-authorized. We talked a little bit about that. And that, by far and away, relieves a lot of stress for both patients and clinicians. Um, I think that's very helpful. I think some of the movement I have seen in drug pricing and drug fulfillment has also helped move the needle a little bit. I've also seen that they are now finally starting to develop standards for interoperability. Now, that's in its infancy, and it's got a lot of potholes. But that also is a movement forward which I think is going to really enhance medical care in the future. So I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I, I do. Uh, but some of those are the things I see moving that needle. Uh, just take away some of the administrative nonsense that is required for us to deliver care as, as a physician and patients to receive that care as patients. Because nothing is any worse than saying, I think you have something really bad. And I have to order this very expensive test to figure that out. We'll get back to you in two or three weeks till we get the insurance company to say it's okay. I mean, but, that is complete and utter crazy making for everyone involved. So radical thought around here. And, you know, one of the reasons that I feel we, we move to this lowest common denominator all the time. And, you know, prior auth is a good example of that where, you know, 99% of the population is trying to do good. They're not, you know, I don't think people don't get up with the intention of deceiving the system, you know, squeezing for, for maximum value for personal, whatever. I just don't buy that. There are small exceptions. But what ends up happening is every time somebody does it, we find that the system goes, oh, my God, I hadn't thought about this as a, a, a route around to, uh, you know, deceive the system and squeeze money out. So we must put a new control in place. 
And I, again, I think about other industries. And for me, education is one where testing and uh, not getting into whether testing's right or, or whatever. But what I thought was really interesting that they did, instead of focusing on the, the process of the test, uh, you know, and, and we do see that where, you, you know, you go through metal detectors, you know, they almost strip search to make sure you're not bringing in um, uh, elements to, to uh, cheat the system. But they use statistical analysis post the event to say, we can see that people are cheating here. And instead of focusing on, let's change the whole system for everybody, let's fix it in the back end and accept that there will be some cheating in the system, but we will catch it and, you know, deal with it subsequently. Is that perhaps the way to think about this and the way that technology could help us in the future? Well, I really like that idea. Um, it is it's, it's a synonymous with the taking off your shoes at the airport. We had one person sit there, and they had a bomb in their shoe. Now everybody's taking their shoes off. Still, still taking their shoes off. So now it's the same thing in healthcare, and I'm going to call it reimbursement because the reimbursement is mul multiple different things. Um, you have a person get around the system by doing X, make the penalties for that severe, and put systems in place to prove it. So what the money has been paid out but you can get the money back. I mean, that's it's part of it. It's part of the process. So don't penalize everybody mm. for 2%, 3%, 5% of bad actors in the system. That that just doesn't work. Yeah, I, I, I like that. And I, I, I think the um, um, I, I just maybe disagree with the percentages. I'm, I, I guess I'm more in the hopeful side that it's less than 1%. But you might be right. <laughs> How many people are focusing on that? So... I, I, as you think about the future, wh what are you excited about? Where do you see this going? You know, what, 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 you know, keeps you driving to a positive outcome for healthcare and for, uh, you know, our population? Well, one of the things that um, I never had, even in a multi-specialty group practice with a unified medical record, was a real complete picture of a patient's story. We had two big clinics in town. There was stuff over there and there's stuff over here. One of the things that really excites me is starting to get a unified picture of a patient's health and all of their data elements together. So wherever you go and whatever you have, the physician or the team who's treating you know that. So you wind up in an emergency room, passed out, no history. They get to a system that says, oh, Jay takes this, 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 and he's had this and this done, and you know, everything they need to know about Jay is right there. So whether Jay can't talk or not, or Jay's wife's not there or whatever, it'll be there. That's exciting to me. That takes a lot of moving parts to do. Data's got to be, you know, standardized. There's got to be a standardized protocol. There's got to be a way of transmitting it. There's got to be a way to find it. So that really excites me about healthcare moving forward. It's not going to be just one thing, but I think getting the medical record together is going to go a long way to really move the needle both for quality and satisfaction. I, I think what's really interesting about that concept was the, the company that you talked about, which ultimately disappeared, right? Which that was their sole purpose, was to bring all of that information together. So what's old is new again. I think, uh, it, you know, there's, there's not a physician on this planet that wouldn't want that capability to be able to deliver the best possible care. And I think the one thing maybe I would add is, with the appropriate level of security um, and the ability to get to it without securing it so much that you can't get to it because you can't unlock the key to get to the information. But I think we can do that, and I think technology can help. Unfortunately, as usual, we've run out of time. Just remains for me to thank you for joining me on the show. Jay, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Nick, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining me today. Do you have any better ideas or have you found a small incremental change that's brought about a big improvement in your world? Let's continue the conversation on our hashtag, The Incrementalist, or share with me at Dr. Nick One on Twitter. You can find more information about the show on our program page at healthcarenowradio.com. And tune in next time to hear my discussions with leaders and innovators from around the globe who've revolutionized their space by using small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist, 
and I'm starting a revolution through evolution.